So that is not true. Not everyone is a child of God. As a matter of fact, he points to those scribes and Pharisees and he says, you are a child of the devil, the father of all lies, a murderer from the beginning. So we're not, you're not born automatically a son of God. Go, to, go with me to John chapter 1, verse 12. So you are not born naturally as a child of God. That comes by faith in Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, But as many as received him, to them, to them he gave the right, he gave the authority to become children of God. So who becomes children of God? Those who receive Jesus Christ. If you have not received Jesus Christ, you have not become a child of God. You're still a child of wrath, destined for a perishing. But then he says this, to those who believe in his name. So he explains, what does it mean to receive Jesus? It means to believe in his name, to put your trust, your confidence in Jesus. The moment you do that, you no longer are a child of wrath, but you become a child of God. This is a great privilege. Um, let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And, and look at verse 15 with me. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but here's what you did receive. You received in the past, at your moment of salvation, the spirit of adoption, so let's talk about this new relationship, how you become a child of God, a son of God. The Bible says you do not receive again a spirit, a spirit of bondage, bondage is slavery, to fear. So remember I have a sinful disposition? At one time I was a slave to sin, and I feared death. I wondered, what would happen when I die? The very moment I take my breath, do I cease to exist? Is there really a hell? Is there really a heaven? What goes on? I mean... The Bible in Hebrews 2 says that unsaved people have a fear of death. They don't know what's going to happen when people die. And they look at the grave and they look at a casket and they wonder, what happened to that person? And so there's a fear. There's a bondage to sin and there's a fear that comes with that. That is not the spirit that we have received, again, from God. That we were born with that bondage to fear and sin. What have we received? Verse 15 says, but you, believers in Jesus, have received the spirit of adoption. So let me tell you some things about divine adoption. Of course, this is different than a natural birth. Adoption is when a child goes with parents that they are not biologically related to. So that is adoption. You and I are not biologically related to God the Father. We have been separated from him by our sin. So what God has to do to make us his children is he has to adopt us since we can't be naturally born because of our sin. So adoption, what Paul's referring to, is what took place in Roman society. It was a legal procedure in Roman society, not so much known for the Israelites and the Hebrew culture, but Romans did have adoption and adoption ceremonies. Here's how it was used. It occurred when there was a wealthy adult. Some adult who has a great estate money and property and all sorts of things, but he has no heir to leave it to. So not wanting the government to get his money, he adopts a child, a youth, or a young adult, and he says, I bring you into my house as my heir, as my son. Let's listen to the things that took place. At the very moment of adoption, when this wealthy individual would bring a, a child or a youth into his house as an adopted son or daughter, in the Roman case, it was a, a son, all of the old debts and the legal op obligations of that young person were paid. Isn't that cool? Every legal obligation and debt was paid by the new father. Just like you and I come to the Lord with a baggage of sin, all of that has been forgiven and laid in, and put aside. Secondly, the newly adopted son received a new name. I think that's great. The Bible promises in the book of Revelation that we, believers in Jesus, receive a new name from him. And it's even a name that nobody else knows, but God will mention it to me in heaven. Like everybody here, Brian, you know, everybody knows me by Brian or B. Wheats or whatever, you know. But, but up in heaven, the Lord has a, a name for me that nobody else will know. And when he whispers it out of whoever's in heaven, I'll be like, oh, that's me. Yep, he just, he just called me. He just talked to me. So you receive a new name. Thirdly, that newly adopted one now becomes the heir of all the father what he has. So when the father passes away, 
that um, that young individual now owns the entire estate. Fourth, the new father becomes liable for all of his new son's actions. So there's a responsibility there. So you and I as believers, when we live out our life, and let's say that we go into sin, we, we walk according to the flesh rather than the spirit, like I spoke about this morning, the father's reputation gets tarnished. He is the one that looks bad. People would say, wow, Brian Weed is a Christian? If that's what a believer in Jesus is like, then I want nothing to do with it. You see how that can harm my father, my heavenly father? That's part of the relationship, this new relationship I'm speaking about. And last, the new son had the obligation to honor and please his new father. So this was all part of adoption in the Roman culture. And Paul says, you and I have been adopted by God the Father, brought into a relationship as father and children. Now he goes on in that verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, that's the bondage to your sinful nature, and it brings about fear and condemnation and guilt and shame, but you received the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, this sonship that we talked about in verse 14, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, this would have been shocking to the Jewish people because the Jewish people, they had such a huge, high, holy reverence for the name of God. God dwelt in a tabernacle, in a tent, and there was a distance between them and the presence of God. So everything about God was scary. The fences, the priesthood, the sacrifices, and they wanted to be as far from God as possible and yet still worship him. So they never re referenced in the Old Testament, they didn't reference God as father, typically. And the, the average Jewish person, person would never call upon God and say, God, you are my father. They would actually not even say the name Jehovah, Yahweh. They would say Hashem. Hashem in the Hebrew means the name. They would not even use God's name. They would just say Hashem, the name. So when Jesus comes on the scene and he's calling God Father, it would have been shocking to everybody. This new intimate relationship. But the word Abba in the Aramaic, it means this. It means daddy. It means papa. So you and I, by being adopted into the family of God by faith alone, having all of our sin and legal and debt obligations paid in full by the cross, having the inheritance of the Father as part of our blessing, um, we get to cry out, Papa, Daddy, Father. I, I, I think it's like this. It's a word of intimacy. Like when I talk about my dad, I call him Dad. I, I've, I don't think in my 53 years I've ever said, Father Wita. Father Wita, could I have $10? You'd be like, Dad, can I have $10? Because Dad is a, a word of intimacy. It's a word of closeness. It's a word of confidence. It's a word of trust. It's the idea that my father is there with open arms and I can run into his arms and, and he can hold me in his lap at any moment. And that is the privilege of you and I being children of God, having the Spirit of God living in us. We become sons of God, daughters of God, but we're adopted into his family and, and thereby, through the spirit of adoption, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Intimate, confident relationship. This word we cry out, it's the idea of a loud cry, a deep emotion. See, it's not just like intellectually. I can tell you about God. He created all things. He does this. He does that. It's not just intellectual. It's not, theolog it's not just theological, and it's not just doctrinal. It's personal. It's relational. Like when I, when I see Jesus face to face, when I, see, when I see his smile and I hear his voice and I look into the eyes of the one who was crucified outside of Jerusalem, it's going to be the most intimate, loving moment of my entire life. It's, there's going to be nothing that will ever compare to that very moment. That's the idea. So we have a new relation. Secondly, we have a new motivation Look at this, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. All of the sons of God, all of those adopted into God's family, again, it's by faith alone and not by works. It's not by religion. It's not by rituals. There's nothing you can do to be included in God's family. You have to just believe in Jesus, trust him alone. The Bible says all of those who are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. 
So we have a, a new motivation. So what does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? Let's talk about that. Well, first of all, we know the Spirit of God is the comforter. He's the helper. He is my guide. He's my teacher. So I have the greatest guide, the greatest comforter, the greatest teacher ever living inside me. Now, I hear a lot of people say this. I'm a driven person. You know, I'm driven at work, and I'm, I'm a purpose-driven per whatever, you know, the purpose-driven church, the purpose-driven life. You know, I don't think that is so biblical. I mean, it's nice, and maybe it works for something, but I do think this is very biblical. We are led by the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not browbeat us. He does not um, force us. He does not, with anger, um, you know, push us. He doesn't drive us. The times that this is used, and sometimes it's translated driven, it's, it's the idea of um, leading like a shepherd. It's going out in front. The Holy Spirit is very gentle. He's very kind. He can be grieved. He, be, he can be quenched. And he's firm and he's loving. But he's not, um, he's not mean. The Holy Spirit is one who leads us. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this about um, being led by the Spirit. There is no violence in Christianity. What the Spirit does is enlighten and persuade. Because he is a gentle, sensitive spirit, um, he can easily be grieved. The Holy Spirit never browbeats us. The impulse can be strong, but there is no driving. There is no compulsion in our God. So we want to be led by the Spirit. You know what I hear all the time? I hear things like this, not from people around here, but like when I'm with others, they'll be like, oh, I feel led by the Spirit to do such and such. I'm like, really? How does that work? Well, I just feel the Spirit's leading in this way. And it's always something that's fun and enjoyable. But the, the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to lead them into suffering and bad things, but always the, into good and glorious things. It's almost like the Holy Spirit's leading is a special feeling I get where it's like, ooh, I, yeah, that's exciting. That must be the Holy Spirit's leading. I don't think that's biblical. I don't think the Holy Spirit is leading us like he's giving us guidance on who we're going to marry, where we're going to live, should I get a new job, where should I sit in church, well, I feel the Holy Spirit's guidance to sit there, that type of thing. I don't think that's the direction that we're talking here. Let me explain why. Look at the key word of verse 14, for, the very first word, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. For, you know what the word for means? Because. The word because means we better know what's coming in the previous verse. Look at the previous verse. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So you have two options. Number one, you, if you live according to the flesh, you set your mind on sin of this world, the pleasures of this world. Um, as you saw this morning, it means God will chasten you as a believer. You don't lose your salvation, but there's a premature physical death that is in line, in line for you if you continue. So if you live according to the flesh, that's your one option. But if you live according to the Spirit, that's another option. But if you live according to the Spirit, you will what? Put to death the misdeeds, the sin of the body. For as many as are led by the Spirit. So here's what I believe the leading of the Spirit is. The leading of the Spirit is the, is the influence and power that the Spirit gives me to say no to sin, to actually put to death the members of my body that want to sin. That is the Spirit's leading. He's not like guiding me with emotions and feelings like, oh, you're feeling happy, you better do it. Oh, you're not feeling happy, you better not do it. That is so untrustworthy. What the Holy Spirit is doing is he's, he's convicting me and giving me power to say no to sin and yes to the things of God. Now let me prove that to you. Hold your place there. Go to Galatians 5 quickly. Galatians 5. So over past the Corinthians, go to Galatians chapter 5, and you'll see all of these phrases about the, about the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16 says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, right? And you, are not, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, so he's been talking about the fleshly works and the Spirit works. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not, you are not under the law. We know that under the law produces all sorts of sin. 
but you are not led by the Spirit. So there again, you see a reference about putting to death the sin and living for the Lord. So you have walking in the Spirit. You have being led by the Spirit in verse 18. Verse 22, you have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I see in the text all of those being synonymous. Walking in the Spirit is being led by the Spirit. It is bearing the fruit of the Spirit, and it is living in the Spirit. All of that is tied together. So the leading of the Spirit is leading me to live for righteousness' sake and saying no to sin. So every believer, every born-again believer, every child of God is being led by the Spirit of God to say no to sin and yes to righteousness, to put to death the deeds of the body, to put to death all the fleshly lusts that war against our soul, and to say yes to the Lord Jesus and to the things like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. So that is the leading of the Spirit. It is, I think, definable, and it is something that the Holy Spirit will do in every single believer. Now, whether you want to be led or not is a different story. Whether you respond to the Holy Spirit or not is a different story. He doesn't force you to produce fruit or to allow him to produce fruit. You can simply go back to the slavery of sin, but at great cost and at great consequence. Go back to Romans chapter 8. There's a third thing. I told you there's four things, and I'm going to try to get him in tonight. We have this new relationship. We are sons and daughters of the Father. We are adopted into his household. And um, we also have a new motivation. We are living by the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, not by the power and influence of the sinful disposition. And now Romans 8. Thirdly, we have a new validation. Romans 8, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, putting to death the deeds of the body, these are sons of God. That's your life. That's your new life. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage. You're not a slave to sin anymore. That'll, that'll bring fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. You are brought into the family of God as an adopted child with full rights and privileges by whom we cry out, Daddy, Papa, Abba, Father, with intimacy, confidence, trust, and joy in a father-son relationship. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. All right. So there's a, there's a new validation that comes with me being born again. So there's two witnesses here. Do you catch them? The first witness is the spirit himself bears witness. But who's the second witness? With our spirit that we are children of God. All right. So I have two witnesses that tell me that I'm, I'm a child of God. Let, let's talk about the first one, which is me. Guess how I know I'm a child of God? Because I was there when it happened. That's how I know. I was there when it happened. Everyone should know that they are born again. Everyone should know that they have put their faith in Jesus. And as a result, they have new life and transformation. Right? So my spirit can testify of my salvation because I just happened to be there at the time. It was a Friday night, October 1st. I had, um, our, I, had, I had planned, uh, well, I had tried to uh, commit suicide. I thought, life is not worth living. I will end it all. And I'm in the hospital thinking there's no hope for life. Life stinks. And the only way out, I will take any way out just to get out. And then when I, when I received Jesus Christ, it was like, I get it. I get it. I now know what this world is all about. I now know that I was created for a purpose to know and to love Jesus. And instantly, it was like light flooded a dark house. It was like literally life came to a dead corpse. And I was like, I get it. I know why Jesus came. He came for me. He died in my place. He paid for my sin. And he is giving me new life and he wants to live with me forever. So who cares what goes on in this world? And who cares who's against me? I have the Lord. And I was a witness to that, just so you know. But I was 26 at the time. Some people that are young don't necessarily remember that, but you should have a witness of yourself. But then it says in verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with my spirit. So he somehow is also a, a witness that can stand up. No, check this out. In, a, in, a, in an adoption in the Roman society, you did not just go before the court system or the magistrate and adopt a child. You had to bring seven witnesses. 
Seven. Why? Just in case some of those witnesses died off from age or disease, there would come a day when you died and somebody would contest the will and they would contest the fortune. And they would say, this so-and-so doesn't deserve the estate. He's not a true son. And one of the witnesses or two of the witnesses would stand up and say, he is a true son. I was there. See how that would work? It would validate the whole plan of adoption. So when I was born again, I was there and I can testify that it actually happened. But the Holy Spirit stands with me and says to the world, yes, I can agree this transformation happened in Brian's life, October 1st, 1993. But my question is, how did he do it? How does he testify? Okay, you may not agree with me, but this is my view. He does not whisper in my soul, Brian, you're saved. Brian, you know Jesus. He's not like whispering to me or speaking to me in, an, in a voice. And he's not giving me a special feeling like, ooh, that was cool. You know, it's, it's not a feeling and it's not a voice. So how does the, the Spirit of God witness with my spirit that I'm a child? Well, I think it is very plain and very practical. So my view is that the Holy Spirit immediately begins to produce fruit, a transformed life. Remember that um, part of the being led by the Spirit is saying no to the deeds of the flesh and saying yes to the spiritual things of God. And that produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. So when I became a believer, the Holy Spirit, under his influence and power, I became a much kinder person. My, my mouth cleaned up. I, I wasn't swearing and, and, I, and I wasn't going to the bar and playing pool like I used to. And, and it's not that no, nobody ever said, don't do these things. It's just that the Holy Spirit was producing fruit in me that was such an assurance that I'm a believer. And it wasn't that I'm trying to do this in my own effort. It was through the word of God and the Holy Spirit producing this fruit that he's testifying, yes, there has been a transformation in Brian's life. I bear witness, and his bearing witness is bearing fruit. So it's not a, it's not a word or a feeling. It's something, I think, very practical. All right? And everybody bears different amount of fruit. We have an apple tree in our backyard. Actually, it's at the very bottom of our leaching field, so all that, you know what I mean? So it usually grows great apples. It really does. But last year, this apple tree, it bore nothing. Right, Melissa? And, I, and I'm shocked. We've, been living, we've, living, we've lived there 20-some years, and every year we have tons of apples. Last year, no apples. And this year, maybe six or seven blossoms have already come and gone. No apples this year either. And so some believers, they, even though they are, being, they are led by the Spirit as the Son of God, yet they're just not producing the fruit that they ought to be producing. They're living under the bondage of sin again and all of that. But... Um, so we could look at Galatians 5, how that provides assurance. Um, and he validates my adoption through his work in my life. And his work is bearing fruit. It's a very practical thing. And then lastly, let's look at the last thing, Romans 8, verse 17. And if, or, and since you're children of God, then heirs. And here's really where I don't want to lag on this. I want to be clear about this as well. And if children then heirs. Part of the adoption, heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we have a new compensation. You know what I would have gotten if I'd stayed in Adam? If I had died back in 1993, as I tried, if I had died, guess where I'd be right now? I'd be in torment. I'd be in flames. I'd be wanting one drop of water for my tongue, and that would have been how many years ago? 28, 29 years ago or whatever? Um, 28 years ago? For 28 years, I'd be in torment wanting one drop of water. And I would not be satisfied. I would not be content for those 28 past years nor all eternity in the future. That would be my compensation. But when I switched and I put my faith in Jesus, the new cons compensation is a joint heir with Christ. But the first part we become heirs of God. All right, let me tell you a quick story. Can I tell you a quick story? Are you guys up for that? I don't want to lose you here because I know sitting still for a while is, is, can, be, can be difficult. But listen to this. Back in Genesis, there was a battle in a valley 
five kings, five major kings got together against Abraham and his 300-some servants, right? Who's going to win? Well, Abraham wins because Abraham, God's on Abraham's side. Abraham's on God's side. So Abraham wins against the five kings of the valley, and now he's got plunder and booty and all sorts of treasures. Like he is the wealthiest man in the world. He finishes, he wins, and the king of Sodom comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, take whatever you want. I mean, it's all yours. You won it, fair and square. And Abraham said what? He said, I will take nothing from you. I don't want anybody ever saying that I received anything from these kings. So he said, I will not even receive a shoelace from you. I will, I will accept no reward. Now, he walks away with nothing. Now, what's Abraham thinking? Abraham's thinking, oh, what did I do? I just threw a fortune away. I have nothing. Can you imagine this feeling? In Genesis 15, that night, God appears to Abraham, Abram. And do you know what he says? Fear not, Abram. Don't be afraid. You just threw away a fortune? Don't be afraid. Why? For I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Do you know what Abraham got in that deal? The Lord. You know what his inheritance was? Not the riches of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not the tents and the dishes and the food and the wealth and the weapons and the horses and the camels and the jewels. That's not what he got. He gave it all up. His inheritance was the Lord. God said, I will be your exceedingly great reward. Listen to this text in Psalm 73. I'm going to just read it to you. It's such a great one. This is the attitude, I think, of Romans 8. Um, Nevertheless, the writer says, I am continually with you. You, God, hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, that's like the Holy Spirit, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion my inheritance forever. Who's his, who, what's his inheritance? The Lord. So my inheritance, when I'm a joint, it says this in Romans 8, verse 17. It says that I am, I am a, um, an heir of God. My inheritance is of God, and I'm a joint heir with Christ. But my heir, I'm an heir of God. It's not that, that I get things. It's that I get God. He is my portion. And if, and if I have the Lord, then I don't need anything else. Anything else that I get is like, that's no problem. Who cares about that? I've got the Lord. He is my inheritance. He is my portion forever and ever. And I think we get so man-centered that we think, I want a big mansion in heaven. And I want, to, I want to have a big oak tree, and I want my house to be on the corner, and I want to put it by a river. And then, Lord, I want a big table in the dining room for entertaining, and I, and I want a swing set, and I want, and I want, and it's like, that's my inheritance. But I think the inheritance is we, we have the Lord. There's nothing greater. So let's go back as we look at Romans 8 to conclude. Look at, look at what we receive. And if or since we're children, then heirs. We are heirs. We have a reward coming. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Um, there's a text, in, we, won't, we don't have time to go there, but in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, all things are subject to Christ, and then, then Christ is going to turn everything over to God, so that in God, God is all in all. Remember that text in 1 Corinthians 15? It literally, it means in God, everything, everything for everyone is in God. He is the summation of our reward. He is everything to us. He is our all in all. Well, um, the end of the text, verse 17, says this, If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So there's two parts to our life. Suffering, that's what we're doing right now. That's your journey on earth. It's characterized by suffering. Nothing too easy about this life on earth. The second part, glory to follow. And in 2 Corinthians 4, there's a scale. 
our light affliction, like no matter what we go through, for Paul, it was tremendous trials, tremendous sufferings. He calls it light affliction. For your light affliction is preparing for yourself an incomparable weight of glory. So like whatever suffering I do on earth, whether my body is ravaged with disease, whether every moment is absolute tremendous pain, if, I don't know, whatever, whatever suffering we can endure, like if all the world hates me, and, and most of them do, but if, I, if all of the world hated me, whatever, if, if, if everybody shunned me and I had to live alone eating bugs off of a, a beech tree or something, I mean, I don't know. Let's say that, that everything has come against me. Um, you guess what? All of that suffering for the Lord's sake is nothing compared to the glory that is to come, right? It's just, it's hard to fathom, but I, th I think what Paul's turning now in the text, he wants to put our mind on the future. So he's going to end by saying, what will separate you from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing present, nothing, th no thing to come, nothing in heaven, nothing on earth will ever separate you from God's love. You are eternally secure. Wow, so great. So again, you are sons of God with the spirit of adoption, crying out, Abba, Father. You are led by the spirit of God so that you are led to say no to your sinful flesh and disposition and saying yes to the things of God. You have a witness. You've been validated not only by your own spirit, but also by the Holy Spirit. And you have this great reward of God in the future. Just life with Jesus for all eternity. There is nothing better. And for those who do not believe, I did a funeral, what, just a couple weeks ago. And um, for those who don't believe, what sadness. There, there's just no joy, no hope, no comfort. And um, for the believer, we get all, all of this, plus more. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this text that shows that for those who have the Spirit of God, those who have put their faith in Jesus, they are not trusting how good they are. They don't think they can earn their favor, your favor, by doing anything, by some ritual, by some church attendance or prayers, or, but by faith alone, just putting our faith in what Jesus did for us. You have promised, and you do not lie, you have promised eternal life to those individuals. And I know, Father, many people are, are trying to be more good than bad. They're putting their hope in religion. They think somehow going to church will bring them into a right relationship with you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It is by your grace through Jesus' death and his resurrection alone. And at that very moment, they are made children of yours. You adopt them into your family and you give them this rich inheritance which is you. And then we are led by the Spirit as he gives us the power and the, really the desire to do right for the very first time in our life. So thank you, Father. We really cry out, Abba, Daddy, Papa. We're so grateful that this week, in the time of need, and there'll be many times of need, we can cry out to you with confidence and childlike trust because you love us and you will never let us go. Thank you, Father, for this text. Thank you for this church family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, praise God, everybody. Uh, don't forget, Wednesday, we have no dinner.